Oh, if we really believe that, my, 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 if the world believed that there was no eternal life, if we believe that Christmas was more than red suits and jingling bells, if we believe that, one day, All knees will bow, all tongues will confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Pray with me today. God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for anointing this service with your presence. We acknowledge your presence praise and worship and thought, opening up our hearts and minds to receive more of what you would have for us. Direction, forgiveness, conviction, grace, mercy, joy, and your unconditional love. We thank you for it all. Bless me, O oh God, as I deliver this message you have placed upon my heart. Let it bear fruit. Let us have a closer walk with thee and a deep appreciation for the relationships you have allowed us to have one to another. Let us see one another as you see us with that unconditional agape love. Let us be gracious to one another, forgiving and edifying. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us put our hands together one more time for the Lord. We jump to the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth today. As we finish out this quick study on this short book that just has so much for us. Look with me as I read Ruth, the fourth chapter, beginning at the first verse. From the NIV version, hear these words. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz says, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and says, sit here. And they did so. Then he says to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring this matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these that are seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me. So I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he says. Then Boaz said, on one, on one day, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kingsman redeemer says, then I cannot redeem it. Because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel. For the redemption and transfer of property. Become final. One party took off his sandal. And gave it to the other. This was a method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer says to Boaz. Buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders of all the people. Today you are my witnesses. That I have brought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malion. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's wife, as my wife. And in order to maintain the, the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among the family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate says, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming 
to your home, like Rachel and Leah brought together, built up the house of Israel. You may have standing Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem through the offspring of the Lord gives you this woman. May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to a son. The woman says to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. He may become famous through Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons who given him birth. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and cared for him. The women living there says Naomi has a son. and They named him Obed. And he's the father of Jesse, the father of David. You may be seated. I just want to use quickly this morning as we share together. Redeemed. Redeemed. This story of Ruth Boaz begins when Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, returned to Bethlehem from Moab where they had been living. As we recall over the last couple of weeks, Naomi's husband and both sons, one, the husband of Ruth, had died, leaving the women penniless. And without a male protector. We spoke last week about the fact that during this time, if a woman was not attached to a man, it was a problem for her. Women could not own property. and had to be attached to a man or it could mean their own death. They could not fend for themselves. And I want you to keep that in mind. As we see ourselves as a Ruth, so to speak, in our account. I also want to introduce to you today a term that we've briefly mentioned over the last couple of weeks. And that term is kinsman redeemer. Kinsman redeemer. This was a male relative who, according to Jewish law, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, who was in danger, who was in need. It is important to note here that the word for kinsman redeemer, Gael, means one who delivers and one who rescues. A person would redeem the property. This person would redeem a relative. This person would avenge the death of a blood relative. So if a relative was sold into slavery, a kinsman redeemer would buy them back. If a relative lost property, the kinsman redeemer would buy that property back. Now, this was all in an effort to preserve the family inheritance for future generations to protect and preserve the bloodline for the family name. Amen. As a side note, before we move on, I believe I need to just spend just a little time here um, talking about this idea of a kinsman redeemer. That was law for them. But it seems like we, <laughs> I don't know what goes on with, with us in our thinking sometimes. The kinsman redeemer was never thought of as the rich relative to bail you out because you can't get your act together. The kinsman redeemer was not the relative who always has to step up and pay for the funeral because you won't get insurance. 
The kinsman redeemer was not the securer of the bail bonds because you can't stay out of jail. The kinsman redeemer was not the rescuer of your mortgage because you won't stay off the boat. We are not Jewish this morning. And all of this is the expectation and all of these things that we automatically assume about those who may have means in our family is not to preserve the bloodline, but just to enable buffoonery and irresponsibility. Listen, be led by God in how you use the resources that God has blessed you with. Don't allow yourself to be guilted into the hijacking of your resources that God has made you accountable for just because we relate it. Do not be an enabler to irresponsibility, especially as it relates to your blood family members, because this is not the will of God. Do not entertain what you should be doing and should be giving since you godly. That is a satanic lie and is coercion. As God at times is tough on us, God will lead you to make some tough decisions as it relates to our family members and their financial responsibility or lack thereof. I hope that blesses somebody this morning. In our account today, we find Boaz as a kinsman redeemer. And I want to do this message today and just make a couple of parallels with this story as we can see the hand of God in our life. We can see what we actually look like. Mm. And we can see clearer the role Christ plays in our redemption. We spoke last week about Ruth going to the field to glean. And I believe that she was guided by the hand of God to a particular field belonging to a man named Boaz. And in this account, we see that while gleaning in the fields, Boaz took notice of her. It's important to note again that he takes notice of her without all the extra. <laughs> She's slaving, gathering, hot sun, Bethlehem, in that part of the world. She didn't have to put on fancy clothes, perfume. Boaz had already noticed her. Even though in chapter 3, her mother-in-law, thinking that she knows better, says to do just that. Get, your, get yourself fixed up, girl, and, and go lay at his feet so he can notice you. I want to first say for us today, we have nothing to offer. We have nothing to offer as it relates to our being redeemed. Just like Ruth, we are broke. We cannot fend for ourselves. We're in need of help. 
We're in need of rescuing. And I want us to think about that on spiritual terms. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are sin-cursed rebels on our way to an eternity with God, separated from God, to which the Bible calls hell. We often struggle to make sense of things. We struggle with self-identity. We struggle with relationships and friendships and we don't seem at times that we're able to win. What we think is, you know what? I can just put some money on it. If I just achieve some success or something physical, something tangible that could get me out of this spiritually bankrupt position, then I will be better. This is why the Bible tells us to be cautious of the wiles or tricks of earthly riches. They give us a false sense of security. They will mask our true depravity. They will keep us from seeing that we need a redeemer. They will keep us from seeing that we need to be saved. This is why Jesus is called our redeemer. What is he redeeming us to? Because it's one thing to want to be redeemed. Don't we want to know what we're being redeemed to? I'm glad you asked. We're being redeemed to our created relationship with God. Now, God created mankind to worship him. God created man to be in perfect fellowship with him. Look in your own time back at the book of Genesis. And I want you to think and, and look at Adam's relationship with God. He walked with God. He talked with God. He didn't have a care, a worry, a concern of any kind. Everything was blissful. It was even God who says, it's not good for you to live alone. I'm going to make you a helper. Understand that Adam didn't ask for Eve. Another sermon. God gave him Eve. I'm making the point of that is that that it's our created position and relationship with God. When man sinned against God, that created position was broken. It was compromised. It was distance. And, and, and here is Adam trying to run and hide from God trying to cover himself with tree leaves. Then trying to present himself as acceptable to God, covered in stuff that he made. And it was God that demonstrates that sin causes death. There is to be a blood sacrifice to atone for sin. And God did that. When an animal was slaughtered, take these leaves off and he covered them with the skins of animals. The sacrifice as an example of atonement for sin. How does this apply to us? Everyone here, everyone in creation, humankind, are born of the Adamic race. That means of Adam. Which means we're born in, in sin in need of redeeming. God's plan to redeem us started before there was an us. Jesus sees us just like Boaz saw Ruth. At our worst, unable to help ourselves, destitute, and will spiritually die without redemption. Mm. 
Jesus sees us without all the fancy clothes. Jesus sees us without all of the educations and letters behind the name. Jesus sees us without all of the wealth and money and whatever we try to do to clean ourselves up, to put on these leaves that we made to make ourselves acceptable, perfumed up and dressed up to present ourselves to Jesus as worthy. Jesus says, stop it. You know, this is what I had to come to grips with. I heard Jesus one day when I was playing church. Kind of just kicking it. Doing it too. I'm in the sound ministry. I'm in the choir. I'm just having a good old time at church. I'm on the church bowling team just going crazy. Just, just hanging out with church folks because they wasn't all bad. And, and, and Jesus spoke to me and he says, Cedric, I know you. The real you. But I got a question. Do you know you? Because all this stuff that you're doing around here, it's, it's all right. People are even being blessed by it. But don't be confused by it. Works don't equal salvation. Salvation produces the works. He says, Cedric, apart from all of the world's accolades, the position, the earthly prosperity, he says, apart from all of the stuff, I need you to see you. I need you to look in the mirror and see what's left after all of that is burned away. A sinner in need of redemption. I see, I need you to see yourself having nothing to offer at this table of salvation. I need you to understand that you come to this Table of salvation to, with nothing to offer but your sin. That's all you got. All that stuff means nothing at this table. I need you to see yourself spiritually naked. So we say things like, you know what? I'm going to come to church soon as I get myself together. Let me say, it is a waste of everybody's time, especially yours. I am a witness. It was a waste of time, me trying to get myself to act the part. And I can pray the prayers that I've heard other people say. I can dress so I don't stand out and stand when people stand. And gifts come without repentance. So me working in the ministry, just, it just came natural. What that actually means, if we're still trying to get ourselves together, what I said to myself, what Jesus was trying to get me to see, is I refuse to see myself as all bad. I refuse to say I don't have anything to offer but my sin. I done did a whole lot of good in this world, Jesus. That's got to count to something. Put that on the side of the balance scale of salvation. I refuse to believe that Jesus actually loves the stench of my sinful life. That's what I say when I'm just trying to get myself together. Jesus couldn't love the real me because I don't love the real me. And I won't even look at the real me. I'm just going to be somebody else and, and dress myself up and just be something else in life because I don't like me. Ruth didn't need to do all of what Naomi was telling her to do in chapter 3. We don't need to do all of that in the chapters of our life. 
People say, well, if I can't, if I can't give an offering, then I ain't coming to church. Mm. Then I get some money, and I still won't give an offering. <laughs> Another sermon. <laughs> we don't need to do all of that in the chapters of our life, trying to get to heaven on our own, trying to make ourselves presentable for our kinsman redeemer with all the extra. When we see ourselves as Ruth, when we see ourselves as we have nothing to offer, when we quit trying to cover ourselves with all of the stuff of the world, then we can be redeemed. Then we're ready to accept salvation. Then we're ready for our kinsman redeemer. When we are redeemed to our created position with God, then we begin to understand who we are. I'm going to tell you, I had serious identity crisis. Figuratively and literally, I was like three or four people. But when I was redeemed, I began to know who I am. Not all of these created alter egos I had made to protect myself, right? I didn't want you to know me because you may hurt that person. So you're not going to know him. Mm. Then I understood that my life had purpose more than just what I had been doing, living, then I knew that there was a reason for me being here. It's not an accident. It's not an oops. God actually had a plan for my life. And now I can receive that plan as I begin to mature spiritually and walk in that plan. I don't have to waste any more time. I can now be unselfish enough to live in harmony with other people. I can look at other people as, look what God can do for this person. I can pray with people instead of praying on them. Mm. I can love others unconditionally because I had received that unconditional love from God. I could now give others grace because now I knew what it was because I'd received that grace from God. I never had to hold somebody else to a standard of perfection that I knew I couldn't even achieve. Redemption brings expectation. Redemption brings expectation. Now, I'm sure that Ruth had absolutely no expectations from Boaz. How could she? Didn't have an idea of what her life would become, how God would use her. None of that. All she knew is that she needed saving. She needed help. She needed redeemed. Or she may die for me. I did not know what God had in store for me. I didn't know the future miracles God had for my life. I couldn't even recognize the miracles that were in my life. All I knew is at that point, when Jesus allowed me to see me, that I needed saving, I needed help, I needed redemption, I said, God, I'm not worthy of anything from you. I don't have anything to offer you. I just ask for your forgiveness of my sin. I ask to be covered in the atoning blood of your son, Jesus. I ask that you would remember me in your kingdom. I am a sinner and I know that I deserve hell. I have sinned against you and I just lay on your altar spiritually naked and when I received 
the redemption of Jesus. Something happened. Not only did I receive salvation, my expectations changed because of one verse of scripture. Romans 8 and 32. Romans 8, 32. Hear these words. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I serve a God who owns everything, created everything, is everything. I don't have to want for anything. I don't have to be defined by anything but God. I had lived my life defined by stuff. The better the stuff, the better the definition. God did not even spare his own son, which means God loved me enough to allow his son to die such a murderous death that I would have the opportunity to be his child, adopted into the family of God, grafted into the vine called Jesus, redeemed into the family of God, and now God can freely give me what he's been wanting to give me all along. What God has for me is for me. So let me tell you how it works in my life. And Maybe this whole sermon was just a testimony of mine, and that's okay. When miracles happen in my life, I'm not surprised. I'm excited, but I'm not surprised because that's the expectation of the redeemed. Mm. When people say things like favor ain't fair, you're right. It's not. Favor is the expectation of the redeemed. Of course. God is going to put me in position to shine. Of course, I'm going to be sitting at a table where everybody's wondering, how did I get there? Of course, you're going to be looking at my life and said, how did a way get made out of no way? Favor ain't fair, but the miracles of God are the expectation of the redeemed. Of course, God is going to position me to be of influence to others. Here's the difference. Since I know what God is going to do, that's my expectation. Then I'm in a position where I don't have to hijack the credit for it. You see, if I'm trying to get myself and present myself, everything that happens good in my life, I hijack it and say, see, look at me, because I'm still making my case for when court is in session, I can come before God, the judge, and say, look, this is my case. This is all that I've done, and I need you to give me what you got, salvation. When I'm redeemed, my expectations are different. You see, because now I have a kinsman redeemer. That's better than a way good lawyer. Guess me tell you. I don't even have to show up at court. I don't have to present a case. Why? I'm covered with the blood. That's it. I don't even have to walk by the court. So I don't have to sit here on this, 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 this treadmill just running, trying to make myself presentable before God. I'm covered with the blood, so he sees me as perfect already. So in response to that, I just look to lift up the name of Jesus. I look to see 
to help other people to know and love Jesus, that they may be redeemed also. I worship God because the favor and the miracles are just the expectation of the redeemed. I want you to think about something. Ruth was redeemed by Boaz. Ruth was a foreigner. Ruth was just trying to survive. She wasn't necessarily in the bloodline, kind of, sort of, married into it. She had no expectation of any kind. I'm sure she didn't know what God's plan was for her. But look at how this played out. Boaz married Ruth, gave birth to a son, Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who's the father of David. You know King David, greatest king in Israel, whom we'll talk about extensively next year. Now, who would have thought that an outsider broke, nothing to offer, slaving in a field, a Moabite woman would be in the bloodline of Jesus? Who would have thought that? God did. And I want you to I, I want to say this to you when I was in my uh, gleaning fields of Bethlehem just trying to figure it out make something happen there is no way I would have dreamed that God would use me to lead a congregation an outsider, someone who is far from what I thought would have been pastoral material, didn't know five verses of scripture to heart, couldn't say the word God without an expletive. Someone by who many accounts was too far gone to be redeemed, too far for anything good to come from, but God. So I thank God today. Praise God today. Because just like the songwriter says, he thought I was worth saving. He thought I was worth healing. He thought I was to die for. Even when I didn't think I was worth anything, God knew what he had created. God knew the plan for my life. God knew how the story would end. Let me say this to you, and we'll close. God knew you before you were born. God knows what's going on in your life right now. He knows the trouble. He knows the brokenness. He knows the depression. He knows the loneliness. He knows the self-hate. He knows the struggling for identity. He knows the abuse. God knows the neglect. And as spokesperson for God right now, I'm telling you today, you can expect great things from God if you're willing to take risk like Ruth did. If you're willing to look to look after others before you look after yourself. God is looking today to redeem you. Jesus purchased heaven for us on that cross. We can't make it on our own. 
We're sinners. We're outsiders. Just like Ruth. But God is rich in his grace. God is rich in his mercy. He loves to bless us. If we'd only give him a chance, there is no end to the great things God can do. In the same way, the Lord Jesus bought us for himself out of the curse, out of our destitution, made us his own bride. Blessed us for generations to come. He is our true kinsman redeemer. Of all who will call on him in faith. So don't be like me. Don't keep running. Don't keep trying to make yourself presentable. And even if there's been you, it doesn't matter. You've been in church five years, ten years, all your life. God is asking a question today. Have you seen you? Do you know what you look like? Spiritually naked look like? Because if you're not covered with the blood, there's no other covering that God is going to see you as his child. There's no other covering that will redeem us. So as we go into this time of prayer and invitation, God is telling you this morning, you're worth saving. He sent his son for you. You got to come to grips where you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I don't hate you anymore. You are worth saving. And I'm going to allow God to save me today. Let us pray.